What's happening, everybody? Good to be here. Um, oh man, Ryan Carson, what's up, man? Good, to, good to see you. Um, I just heard you say building, and I missed the first bit. What, what, what are you building? Tell us more. Well, I mean, I have a social influence company called um, Social Proof, so it's pretty amazing. A lot of bang. It leverages, yeah, man, it leverages AI to like uh, do some due diligence against influencers. So it's pretty dope. Smart, I love it. Yeah, I'm just checking it out. It's been I can't remember if we chatted on Spaces before, but I know I follow you, so good to see you. I love it. What do you? We, yeah, Ooh. we chatted and met a lot of times, Ryan. A bil- <laughs> a billion times. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. Wolf, how's it going? It's good. Good. I am just kind of settling into things here today. Posted some stock related stuff this morning, kind of shifting gears a little bit here into more of the AI Web3 spaces side of things. Wanted to get you back on. Uh, I saw you making some interesting posts about Bard's competitor that they're going to be launching to GPT 4. I also wanted to talk a little bit about how, you know, spaces we have now seen uh, what it's going to look like potentially where mm. you can launch it with video. So I just kind of want to get your thoughts on this new wave of social media and AI that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm excited. Excited to chat about it. There's just a million things going on in tech and AI in the world. So it's always fun to hang out and chat on spaces. It'll be interesting to see when video hits kind of how that changes the spaces experience. Cause I think actually one of the fun things about spaces is you don't have to stress about the video feed and kind of what's going on what you look like. You can just focus on being present, but we'll see. Yeah, I think it will change things in some ways, but I also am just curious if it's going to show up at the top of the timeline and show, hey, who has spaces, who has video on, who doesn't have video on. How's it going to be for, is it just the host? Are speakers going to have options to get in there? It feels like there's a lot of variables, you know? A hundred percent. Already seeing some friends in the audience, Kodiak, The Voice. Good to see you, Pappy, Dr. Manhattan, Sage. Appreciate you all stopping by. Yeah, I see Greg down there too. If you want to go ahead and request up, Greg, I'll get you on stage. Uh, the voice of DeFi. See you in the audience as well. Yeah, we're happy to bring some more on stage for this conversation. Um, but Ryan, let me turn it back to you because there was that other piece with the AI stuff. I know you're heavily ingrained in that area. And I want to get your thoughts. What have you been watching these last couple of months? If you look at the traditional stock market, it seems like there's more bullishness on it than ever. You look at like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA and SMCI and some of these companies and they're just soaring. I mean, SMCI is up over 100% already this year. So wow. on February 1st. So curious to get your thoughts on what we're seeing here and what's some of the most interesting tools and opportunities that are standing out to you. Mm. So I think what's happening is a massive disruption in the B2B SaaS industry. And and that may sound, sound specific, but let me why I, uh, explain why I think it's going to affect everybody. Um, oh, Alex is here. What's up? All right. Um, so here's what I think is happening. It, business owners executives, leaders are starting to realize that they're way overpaying for software. Um, so they're looking down their P&L and they're basically saying, wait a minute, you know, we pay $2,000 a month for Slack. What, do, what are we doing? And then they're seeing software that you can purchase now or build in-house. So for instance, um, uh, Basecamp, uh, which is 37, 37 Signals just built, um, something called Once, which is basically software you buy, you download it and you run it yourself. And they they basically uh, released a a Slack competitor called Campfire, and it's like three hundred bucks. And you basically run the code locally, um, and you own it. And I think every single engineering leader or executive is going to say, "Wait a second, I could have one of my engineers um, build our own." version of this in-house and if they don't know exactly how to do it they're going to use a large language model to help them and we'll just own the software and and we'll save you know ten thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year on that so i think i think that's one thing that ai is just going to completely um, disrupt uh, businesses across the board yeah i i think that's a great point there and one of the areas where it's clearly already showing disruption is the fact that, and I'm going to drop you coast here if you'd like that, uh, is the fact that there's so many job cuts happening, I think has been one of the clearest signs of this yeah. coming to life. Do you think that that's been a big driver of these job cuts we've been seeing? I, I think, sadly, it is. Um, I think, you know, software engineering, uh, and Alex can speak to this as well because I know he codes um, and anyone else on stage who codes, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. But I think 
engineering leaders and CEOs are just realizing they just don't need more engineers. Um, in fact, they could probably cut and get just as much, if not more, out of their team, um, or they could hire more junior people and get the same results. It's just we just don't need as many software engineers as we used to. And then combine that with the fact that a lot of people are realizing they don't even need to be software engineers to build code, right? So they can open up ChatGTP Plus and say, help me build this tool in Python uh, and save their company a ton of money. So I think that's kind of where we're going. So um, that begs the question, is direction and analytics now the new wave in tech more so malcolm you got the craziest feedback ever in your microphone there, there's some it sounds like it's like too close to another mic or something like that ah, like yeah. when uh someone has their mic like next to a speaker let me try well, you know what it sounds like do, do you remember on back to the future when marty plugs in um to this to the speaker <laughs> the voice is laughing you know what i'm talking about i know 110 percent <laughs> what you're talking about and it does sound like that i just hope uh, it doesn't end like uh for malcolm like it did for marty give it a try <laughs> give it a try now how's it sound there you go. That's better. I had to move my away from my face. Your face. You're just too strong for us, Malcolm. That's what's going on. Indeed. Um, so what was the question again? Well, it was really about these layoffs. Oh, sorry, Malcolm, go for it. Oh, no. I was about to ask just kind of to, you know, trail on that chain of thought. Um, so does that mean that now it's the future is going to be more so in analytics and sort of create you know more taking software design in a more creative direction just because the raw coding can now be accomplished via ai and you know in some directions i, I mean maybe i think what's happening is people are being empowered to create like whether it's imagery videos or code like what we're realizing is that you don't need to be a professional software engineer or a professional musician or a professional anything anymore because you have this superpower of an AI next to you, which is both good and terrible, right? It means a lot of the professionals in each in each industry are now suddenly realizing that that they're slightly less valuable than they used to be, or even not needed. But everyone who wasn't a professional now can cre create. And a, a good example is, um, so I was reading into uh, SEO optimization and AI driven articles and um, uh, search engine traffic. And I looked into a tool uh, called Byword, which is amazing. I was about to pay for it. And then I was like, wait, I can build that in Python, you know, probably in a couple of days. So I built it and shipped it. And now, you know, it, I, I, I can create an article for 12 cents instead of, you know, $3. And this kind of thing, every employee at a tech company is going to start doing this. Um, and well, if I think this kind of affects all of the P&Ls for, for every single uh, Fortune 500 company, moving forward now. I just don't know exactly how it's going to play out. I, uh, well, first of all, great to be speaking with you, Ryan. Uh, great to what, be doing What's up, Alex? How are you doing, man? You been good? Doing good. I, you know, I love, I, this is probably going to cause waves, but I love your new username. Just you. I know. I know. Well, yeah, it will cause waves. There's a lot of angry, upset people. Well, Web3 <laughs> made you. Web3 made you. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I cannot believe they said Web3 made you. That's, That's crazy. crazy. You're nothing without your monkey. You're nothing without your monkey. I don't know. Some I think you're still. Did you, did you ever own it? Did exactly. you ever own it? There's nothing, there's there's own nothing own wrong with NFTs? a monkey. There's nothing wrong with a monkey. Just saying. Did I ever wrong. own NFTs, J Crypto? Was that the question? No, no. no I was I'm saying there's nothing wrong with a monkey. That that was somebody else that was saying. That was saying uh, that. Cool. Well, J Crypto, what was the question? I think that was good. A uh, good thing down below. Oh, good thing. I don't know who oh, who's asked the question. I was just that was Poppy. That was Poppy. I, I think I saw a post. I think I saw a post yesterday that you were talking about like your name being NFT God, but you never got into NFTs. And I'm, I just wanted clarity about that. Here's here's some clarity. So as always, let me just hijack this entire space. I I, I swear I have a point. Uh, I'm going to get into about software. I swear to God, right after this. Uh, I was yeah, sure. I was and am still into NFTs. I own uh, an, an absurd amount of my net worth is in NFTs. Uh, when I did start my account, I did talk about NFTs because that's what I was interested in. And then my interests evolved into other things. Uh, I still own the monkey that uh, was my previous profile picture. I bought that monkey twice. I bought it for thirty thousand uh, dollars two years ago, and then I bought it for thirty thousand dollars again when it got stolen from me. 
Um, and then I own a bunch of other NFTs. I own a Chromie Squiggle, which cost me uh, like $20,000 or something. So an absurd amount of my net worth is in NFTs. So I, I, I am just as much into NFTs as I was before I put my uh, obnoxious face into my profile picture. So I hope that so, answers your question, Poppy. So, so there you go. Um, so Alex, tell, tell us your thoughts about AI and software. What is happening here? So I was, yeah, sorry, sorry about hijacking once again. Um, <laughs> I uh, so before I started tweeting professionally, uh, I was in leadership at a, a a pretty major public software company, and I'll tell you, you know, right when COVID happened and they started printing money, uh, the basically the culture at every software company in the world became hire as many people as humanly possible. Hire as many software engineers you possibly can. Whatever number they ask for salary, just pay them that. Whatever it is. I was hiring people and some guy comes in who I'm interviewing and he asks for more money than I'm making. <laughs> I'm in leadership and the individual contributor asks for more money I'm making. And I go to my boss who was the global head of my department and I'm like, he's asking for an absolutely absurd amount of money. It's more than I make. And he's like... So this is going to be a really awkward answer, but just give them that. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> wow, okay. that is that is awkward. <laughs> He's like, I hope you understand. Like, you came in at a time where money wasn't being printed, and now money is being printed. So the the standards of money have changed. And I'm like, okay, that's fine, whatever. I mean, I was making more than I should have anyway. And so we, we so we were in this place in software, and it's not just in my company. This was every single company was hire as many people, hire as many engineers, and pay them whatever you possibly can. And now, all of a sudden, overnight, right, rates are skyrocketing. AI gets invented at the exact same time rates start skyrocketing. And now we're in a place where it's like, oh, fuck, we've made tremendous amounts of mistakes over the last two years. Hiring, we have an absurd amount of bloat uh, across every division, every company, and now there's a technology that just came out that disrupts all this and makes half these people useless anyway. And so now you're seeing layoffs across the board at every tech company. You know, if if you if there's a tech company that hasn't announced layoffs, they're doing quiet layoffs. This isn't really a thing talked about much, but every tech company is doing layoffs whether they announce it or not. The company I worked for, they were basically did quiet layoffs where it wasn't like this one wave where they just laid off a ton of people and announced it to the press. They basically did layoffs in like small, tiny batches over the course of like six to seven months. And what that meant is they didn't have to announce it to the public and look bad that they were doing layoffs. And so basically the point being is AI has, has totally revolutionized software over the last uh, basically year where you've had every software company became too bloated and then a, a software uh, technology disrupted all the companies and now you're having tremendous amounts of layoffs across the board. Um, so that's one thing to watch. For. And then you had the interesting uh, quote from Sam Altman yesterday, which I've been kind of preaching for a few months. I don't want to say I'm ahead of Sam Altman on this, but I've been preaching it for a few months now, which is I think you're going to get one person businesses over the next three years that will become the first business billion dollar businesses built by one person ever. A thousand um, percent. Which I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be that guy. I'm trying to be that one person <laughs> billionaire. So uh, you, it, you're on your way. So let's go. Um, there's a tons of a ton of hands up. I feel like I feel like we should call on some of these amazing folks. Um, I'm guessing the voice was next. Go ahead. I don't know if I was next or not, but I'll I'll go ahead and and, and take the, take the reins. Uh, welcome to everybody here. Uh, I completely agree with everything you're saying, Ryan, and everybody is saying in that AI is going to re revolutionize things, particularly with coding. Let me give you an example myself. Uh, used to whenever I'd want to build something, I would go to Fiverr or Odesk or something like that, and I would hire somebody to to code something for me. Uh, maybe I had a game I had built up. It sure would be neat if they had this. And they would build it, and uh, it, it was good. Well, now I've really gotten into where something will come to my head, and I'll think like, oh, I, I wish that was built. I wish I had this trading bot. I wish uh, I could build this to be able to make pictures just based on this. And I just go to ChatGPT, and I say, Hey, I'd like to build this. Uh, how do I do it? I'm not a coder. I'm, I'm a pharmacist. I don't know how to code. And 
it spits out to me code. And I, I put it in. I've, I've learned about Python. I've actually learned more about coding than I ever would think that I would be able to just from uh, trial and error. But it spits out code. I debug it. I say, this is the error I'm seeing. It says, oh, well, you just need to do this. And it's making me be able to build things that I never have been able to build before through code. What I think will be the future after that, though, is I think eventually this will be just a conversation I can have. It'll use text-to-speech and also be able to just understand what I'm saying and speak back to me. And I can just say, hey, I want to build a website that does this, this, and this. And it says, boom, here it is. No code involved, or at least not to me, the end user. So yes, I do think a lot of things are going to be changing with AI. We're already seeing it, and it's going really fast, extremely. That's wild, isn't it? I mean, it's so empowering for you to be able to do that. And I think you are an, like an army of people that are realizing they can do this. I just imagine an employee who goes to their boss and says, hey, boss, uh, I figured out we're spending 10000 bucks a year on this you know, piece of B2B SaaS software. Uh, I built it, by the way. And it, you know, it doesn't have feature parity, but it's, it's what we need. And we'll pay $0 for it now. I mean, is that person going to get a raise and and be employee of the year? Of course, <laughs> like, and yeah, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, they they should be because anything anybody can do anything now, coding wise, and yeah, it should help them with the job. One of the first things I made was uh, you guys know, guys know I like to do spaces, I like to have co-hosts, things like that. Is I wanted to make a a virtual co-host, right? So I did that. I basically told Chat GPT what I wanted to do. It listens to what we say whenever I call on it. It comments on things that we're commenting on, just like a real person. And it does it in the voice of my choosing through 11 Labs. And uh, yeah, it's this whole thing is great. You're right, Ryan. I'm probably representative of a whole army of people that are doing this already. And it, it's coming. There's more and more people just like me that are realizing what they can do is what they've always wanted to do but didn't think they were able. 100%. And the voice, I keep meaning to... Um, to pop in a space when you're using that tool, it'd be fun. Have you ever written about how you built it and kind of shared all that? No, no, no. Okay, you should. Man, people would eat that up. But yeah, um, sitting on uh, sitting on all that information. But yeah, I I, I'll, I would love to have uh, Kelvin or Victoria, who's my uh, my two <laughs> people, uh, have a have a conversation with you someday. That's so dope. I love it. And real quick thought, and then then we'll go to the next hand. Um, now that you can pull in multiple GPTs into a chat GPT conversation, I think is next level, right? So it probably a lot of you are aware of this, but some of you may not be. So now if you're, if you have a chat GPT plus account, um, you can go find a GPT that you like, and then go find another one that you like, that would be complimentary. I mean, imagine uh, Grimoire, which is an amazing developer chat GPT, and then 11 labs, um, which the voice just mentioned, which does voice and you actually just at reply them to pull them into one chat and you can ask them both to help you. Um, so we're, we're breaking out of this um, little box that we're in where you have one GPT or one AI at a time to help you. And it's next level. Like I created six AI uh, advisors for founders just to be helpful, like a CFO, CTO, um, investor, et cetera. And now you can pull all of them into one chat and actually have your own board meeting. So, um, I'm pumped about that. Ani, I've, you've had your hands up. How's it going? Hey, hey, how's it going? Um, good. Yeah, doing good. Um, so it spread kind of like a question in my head. Um, how different is having access to this kind of powerful technology with AI from when people started getting into computers? And what would you recommend for someone who's actually working on like a software engineering degree or someone who has already been like in that field, like what would you recommend for someone like that to do now? Like, to, are they going to start pursuing um, AI operator kind of um, jobs mm. or degrees or things like that? Like, w what are your thoughts on that? Where does it go next? I, I think people should start playing with um, running models locally. Um, so this is like the next logical step. Um, and I was actually chatting with someone yesterday and said, right now an AI is exactly like 1996 when you had people that would go buy um, the dummies book on how to write HTML. And they're like, I don't know, like, how do you do this? And they'd make a primitive little website and they put it up. Right now, if you're willing to kind of, and, and this is what the voice said, you actually don't have to, you don't have to know anything. You can just ask ChatGPT to help you 
and say, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it until you get it. Um, and then once you, once you become a pro on that, you build a couple things and maybe write a Python script locally that does some cool stuff. Then you can go to hugging face and actually find a, a, an LLM and download it to your machine and run it offline. And this is like the next level, right? Where people are starting to realize you don't need to even be connected to the internet to run a large language model. And you have all these amazing open source models like that Mistral, but basically somebody leaked one of the best Mistral LLMs, which is it, it, it's soda. Like it's, it's almost as good as GPT-4 and you can run it on your local machine and all that really means is you st- you run a file, it's an executable, and then you go to the command line and you just talk to it like you talk to, to chat GPT. It's not that technical, actually, but it kind of gives you that understanding that really helps you understand what large language models are doing and, and kind of go to the next level. Um, and, that, that's my thought. Ryan, something you covered that I think was really important is that you don't even need to know the right questions to ask. And I think that's the beauty of these these LLMs is that they walk you through. Like you can literally say, I want to do this. I don't know where to start. Guide me through it. And Amen. it takes you down that road, right? Like I think that's the biggest benefit to the normies, to the people that don't know how this thing works. It literally walks them through it. Yeah. And you we all of us are afraid of looking dumb. Everybody, no matter how how much you know, how pro you are, you're so scared of asking a, a question that people think is dumb. And now that's just gone. You, you know, you're never going to get judged by an LLM. I'm pretty um, proud of how dumb I look. Just going to put that out there. <laughs> Fun fact, Action CEO thinks he's smart because of the LLM now. Thank you. Thank you, Action. Get, we're all smart now because of LLM. So. <laughs> they don't uh, think we're dumb yet. <laughs> that's right. They'll be like, that was kind of dumb, Ryan. <laughs> We've talked about that before, Ryan. <laughs> Um, let's go to good things. Good to see you. How's it going? Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Yeah, I have a little bit of a different take here. I mean, AI is, is definitely going to, it already has changed our world in, in so many ways, and it's going to continue to do so. Like, on, We're definitely on an exponential curve. But um, I think it's important for people to know, like, this technology is not new. Like, artificial neural networks, which is the basis of all modern AI, were invented in uh, 1958. And so people have been working on this stuff for decades. We've had several breakthroughs in the last, uh, really just in the last couple decades. Um, but as far as like software goes, you're not going to lose uh, software engineers. What you're going to lose is like the types of tasks that engineers are doing today. So, you know, if you're a software engineer or if you're looking to be a software engineer, like this is these are the, the tools that you'll be using. But as far as like what you can get out of like ChatGPT, like it's kind of garbage to be honest like it's it's really just recycling you know the data that was fed into it so if you're trying to do something very simple that's been done a million times yes there's there's good templates there but as far as doing something novel and and actual innovation like you're not going to get that out of a chat gpt and as far as like the the commercial products like that's going to be the weakest stuff out there right like the actual very powerful ai stuff like that's highly protected and you know commercial users will get to use that very very like at the last um will be the last people to use that so it's kind of it's it's really for me like it's important for people to know you know like all of this is based on data that's fed into the models so the most the most valuable data sets like that's the most valuable assets on earth at this point you know 100 percent agree elon musk owns x now he owns uh tesla he owns SpaceX, like between those three companies, like that's some of the most powerful, if not the most powerful data sets on earth. Um, so it really, it just depends on the data that you, you have available to you. But yeah, I mean, it, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Agreed, but I do want to um, sort of call out one thing you said and, and teach people something because I think it's important, right? So if you want to create something and the documentation wasn't included in the ingestion in the latest model, right? Um, say it was April of 2023 was the latest GPT-4 ingestion, then what you can actually do is is called RAG. And a lot of people know this already, but if you're writing code, you can use a tool like Cursor and you can actually pull in current documentation. So you can at reply and say, okay, I need to know about Next.js 14. Like that wasn't a part of the model. And then it actually... Uh, scans the text and pulls it in and embeds it into the model. And then you can 
um, you know, write code that uses the latest documentation. So that's one thing. But the other thing I'll say is, <clears throat> I think we kind of overestimate what we do as humans sometimes, and we'll say, well, you know, AI can't create you know new ideas or or, or new thought or new technology. But it's funny because like all we are is our is basically LLMs, right? So what I've done my whole life is ingest content, right? Whether it's written words, you know, from O'Reilly books or you know, a class in, you know, in computer science or my mom teaching me to be kind to my sisters. And then I, I basically spit out the next tokens that I think are appropriate based off of that training. And I do have, I think, I feel like the original thoughts, but they're probably not as original as I would hope um, because I basically a large language model. Um, and so I, I think that's disconcerting to all of us. Like we thought we could have an original creative thought and that's what made us special but I don't think it is what makes us special. And there's a lot of things that LMs can actually do faster and better, which allow us to focus on other things. So just a, a philosophical thought for the day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's an important distinction too. Like, you know, these things, they really can't create, um, they, they can't abstract, right? They're getting more and more powerful and they can give you the appearance that they can perform abstraction, but abstraction is what separates humans from really every other species. And you're right, Ryan, like we do just take ideas. Basically there's, I mean, the, the thing is called an artificial neural network, which is kind of confusing because it has really nothing to do with the actual neural networks that our brains operate off of. But there are, you know, there are some, some simple analogies um, that people like to use, but that's another important distinction. Um, but yeah, I mean like, you know, humans can take ideas and can create novel thoughts from them. Like we really can't do that. Whereas these machines can't. And the whole, the whole like, you know, bet is that at some point you will reach AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is where the machine can create novel thoughts. And that's like the fear that everybody in the AI community has um, about the technology is that when that happens, then, you know, theoretically, these things basically control us um, because they're, they're better at us at basically, they'll be better at us at basically every other process. So right now, the only thing that we really have over the machines is, is abstraction. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a hot debate that's been going on for decades, but, um, you know, I'm on the side of like, I don't really think AGI is, is possible. If it is, it's going to happen a long time from now, but yeah, I mean, God help us if, if that occurs. I mean, hopefully we're, we're, we're not going to see that anytime soon. Well, good things. And I mean, I'll, uh, like I said, I'll push back only because I disagree with the power of AI just insofar as yeah they might not be capable of ab abstraction but you know what it's like at this point you really don't want ai to be able to actually achieve such but what ai does is it builds these amazing bridges for people who might have the ability to abstract but don't have a good starting point so it's like ai essentially you know it's like yeah it can't really generate mountains for us to climb on let's say we're mountain climbing it can't create a new ledge for us to climb on but it can show us how we ourselves can connect to an entirely new ledge and then begin anew in advancing. And this is the beauty of AI because it does remove a lot of gates, but you do have to have a certain level of ingenuity to learn to use it. But it's like an AI artist, let's say an AI artist has an idea, but they don't quite know exactly how to, you know, finish and draw that idea, but they put it into an AI model and it generates something close to what they're thinking, but there are a few imperfections. Now they can feed it to an actual artist or someone who's actually skilled at gra graphical design, and they can take that to the next level. And then if you refeed that back into AI and you know, sort of give it a give it that as new data, now it's improving, and now you're working sim symbiotically. See, a lot of people want AI to just be this one-stop shop, like it does the work for me, but no, what it sh really should do is allow you to reach new heights with your work mm. and it's like a collab like a collaboration mm -hmm. yeah we should exist symbiotically yeah. with it and not completely rely on it because that's the fear is that eventually we're going to outsource all human thought to ai and we're going to outsource a lot of our creativity and those things will become vestigial within humans and you know what, right yeah. i agree with you yeah 100 thank i appreciate it malcolm um i want to say hello to a couple of friends that popped in the audience cats good to see you faisal king r Good to see you as well. Thanks for stopping by. Um, got a couple more hands up. I believe Melly was or Melee was next. So go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I agree with um, something that you were saying, Ryan, how 
we are very similar to LLMs because um, actually coming from like the perspective of being an author, we're always told it's impossible to write something original. And um, if you look at Harry Potter and how similar it is to um, the Star Wars, like the original series Star Wars, it's like the storyline's basically <laughs> like exactly the same and it's incredibly yep. difficult to pull away from that and really actually write something that wasn't inspired by something without you even realizing it um and it's the same thing with like you know we talk about a simulation um and we're all kind of scratching our heads as to whether we are because whether we are or not the similarities are huge yeah. um but, but i think with ai um like um what's his name good things was saying um that it has been coming for a long time um because it is in a lot of different aspects that we don't necessarily you know realize the effect on and i think as well with like factory automation mixed with ai there are going to there are going to be a lot of jobs that we don't need to do anymore um but instead of being fearful of this i think that we should look at look at it as an opportunity to kind of move towards projects that we actually want to work on instead of just the nine to five grind, you know, Amen. just trying to pay for coffee. Um, so, like, I think it's at this point, it's really worth looking at what you feel in your heart as something that you'd like to move towards if that becomes a possibility, because, you know, AI can really provide these options for us in the future. Yeah. I love it. And is it Melly, Mealy? How do I say it? Melly. Yeah, Melly. Cool. I appreciate your thoughts. Thanks for sharing. Um, let's move on to Kevin. I think you're next. Appreciate you for having me, Ryan. Uh, Alex, it's nice to see you. So, yeah, no, I am a copywriter. So, you know, I use AI almost every single day. And a common misconception that a lot of people have with uh, ChatGPT and really any other AIs out there. I'm very familiar with ChatGPT. I've actually got the premium version for um, ch uh, ChatGPT 4.0 as I use it for my business, my freelancing. But anyway, the common misconception that everybody you know is having in you know today's world is that it's going to actually take away a lot of people's jobs. Um, is going to you know ruin freelancing as a whole. And I actually really like to disagree with that. And that really comes down to what our clients are essentially paying us for. Now, I like to use ChatGPT. Um, the best analogy I could really give is think of a calculator during math class. It's really just a tool that you are using. And a lot of people's fear with ChatGPT is that they're not going to want to hire freelancers because they have uh, you know, ChatGPT in their hands. And although that might be true in extent, it's also uh, building more businesses. Um, my point being... Sorry, I'm just having some brain fog. <laughs> um, it's all right. It was a was it a tough evening? A little bit, yeah. I've been up since four. It's almost noon. <laughs> Oof, that's a um, one. But yeah, no, I was gonna say that you know, ChatGPT is an amazing tool, but people don't realize that with freelancers and um, you know having ChatGPT to at our disposal, the reason clients are paying us is actually for the accountability aspect. And um, I think being able to sharpen ChatGPT to really learn from it. Um, we could really start building on top of that. I don't want to take up anybody's time. I know Ani's been uh, raising her hand up for a while. I just wanted to give a uh, quick summary of everything. It's nice yeah, to thanks, see everybody. Kevin. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah. Go get Appreciate go get some sleep. <laughs> thanks for I stopping by. Uh, I <laughs> will not. Um, not for uh, a while. Ani, go ahead. Nice to nice to have your hand up. Go for it. Yeah. Um, no, I think um, an AI is actually just as good as its prompter. And I say that because not everybody can think the same way, right? Yes, AI has its capabilities. AI has the knowledge base. But if the prompter doesn't know what they're doing or, you know, like whatever the prompter wants to create is what the AI is going to be able to create, right? So if, if it comes to, I think someone mentioned that there's no genuinity that could come from it and all of that. But I think it's because like, we are the ones who's operating the AI. And if we have a vision of creating a certain software that's super unique that nobody has done before, um, it's it's up to us. Like we're going to be the ones creating it. So, you know, AI will be able to create very unique and, um, uh, mm. you know, like something that has never been done before because 
it's the human behind the AI that's thinking about what they want to create, right? Amen. So yeah. So I, I think um <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think that's uh that's what it is. I think the AI is like I, I look at AI as a tool because even like um I think Malcolm was mentioning about AI artists, like um AI artist isn't just a prompter, you know, like it's not it's not about just saying, oh, create me a, an image of a computer. It's not that. It's about the artist thinking that this is what I want to create. This is the tool that I have in front of me, just like if I was going to go grab a canvas or a paintbrush or grab like my iPad and use Procreate. Right. In my yeah. mind, I'm thinking like this is the drawing that I want to draw. This is the this is the vibe that's going to be. These are the colors that I'm going to use. And all of those thoughts, all of that, that entire vision goes into your prompt, just like if you were going to use your hand to go draw something. Right. Absolutely. So I, yeah. So I think like a lot of that is very like um, that's it's like a misconception between everyone who's been saying like, oh, no, AI is ruining everything and this and that. I think people need to think of AI as more of a tool than anything else. I love it. I like the analogy of it being a paintbrush um, and a tool that you wield. Um, so I appreciate you calling out. Uh, Lucas, I'll go to you in, in one second. Um, uh, I would just encourage everybody to to move from... Uh, if So if you're in the audience and you're like, yeah, I've used ChatGPT a little bit. And, um, I've been thinking about AI. Uh, I'd encourage you to to move from kind of consumer to builder. And what I mean by that is just think about a simple tool that you want to build that probably takes code somehow and just say, hey, teach me how to build this thing. And all of a sudden, it's like, uh, for those of you that you know, read the Bible, um, you know, when Paul had the scales fall off his eyes and, and he was on the road to Damascus, you know, and your eyes are open, you all of a sudden will realize like, oh, behind the curtain, where there's just a guy pulling some cranks and moving some knobs and you can be that person <laughs> and you can actually build things like, and as soon as you go from, you know, just kind of chatting with chat GB to actually having chat GBT help you build things, you just go next level. Um, and then all of a sudden I think you'll realize, wow, there's so many things that I could build and do. Um, it's almost uh, infinite. So just a thought there. Um, Lucas, let's go to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, I think it's definitely like a no-code tool. You know, AI is going to do what you're able, you basically you're able to amplify it to do, right? So if you're a coder, you just made your team, you know, uh, five to ten people deep, right? And they're going to be able to get you to a certain extent, meaning they'll be able to build out smaller products and smaller pieces of products that are that are out there. Uh, maybe even a notification system or maybe pull like a couple of things that, you know, you'd give a junior developer or like a, a mid-level ju- uh, developer that isn't like the best, but actually can code some stuff that's like busy work. So AI is like a no-code tool. Um, it could get you to a certain extent, but just like no-code like no, no code development tools gets you to like 80 to 90%. And then if you're a developer, you can tie it off. Like you can then be ultra creative in terms of like, executing so it actually shrink in, it shrinks the time horizon too for you so if you think like software is going to take three months to build it this will you know this could take seven days because of the amplification and back to education piece i think is interesting because i think a lot of these code academies and stuff like that also like general assembly and things like that that are out there like teaching people this is going to augment and if not replace some of their teaching, right? They're going to give some chat GPTs to, to their students to like, hey, here's us teaching you and here's you t- teaching yourself for your homework tonight. In the next four hours, here's your chat GPT that then teaches you all the stuff. And if you have any questions, you literally have a 24-7 person answering it for you, but it's really a chat GPT. I think it's also another thing that's interesting is people are like, Oh, I'm scared AI is going to get angry with us and we're, you know, we're humans and they're going to take over us and treat us like slaves. Like, dude, like you're, it's shocking to hear people think that AI would think anything like us. Like if anything, it's going to think very, it's just going to think differently. And it, and for us to like put, have the ego to think that it's going to think like humans and everything thinks like humans, even an LLM does will eventually surpass us like everybody's scared of but instead it will not think the negative thoughts that we do like we it, we just don't know what it's going to think so yeah. at the end of the day like i think it's i think it's um a little uh ambitious for us to think or actually not ambitious but egocentric to think that you it'll think like 
it'll literally be like humans when it probably will not, even though it's being programmed by humans. Mm. So yeah, Ultron that's a- and Skynet and Skynet says different, by the way, just saying. <laughs> yeah those are accurate i love that <laughs> <laughs> i love it um thanks lucas yeah I, I i i think people are still underestimating the the power of being able to write a couple lines of code like y- y'all software engineering is, is not going to go away you know in a minute like i i think this is like be- saying i want to build a house but i'm i'm just not going to learn how to pick up a hammer um i really do think everybody still needs to to learn how to code a little bit and have ChatGPT help you do that and then all of a sudden, you just have superpowers, um, and it's going to be a long time before everybody uses those superpowers. And and and, and this is it, it is still shocking how little people really even know AI exists. I mean, most of the people I talk to today, today, like I, they don't even they don't even know. Like they're like, yeah, I heard about something, and and I'm thinking, wow, this is wild. I have like I have a team of like ten super intelligent, high IQ, always available, always encouraging people now surrounding me, like. Why would everybody not want that? So um, let's go to Pappy next. Let's, let's just jump in real quick. That's my uh, favorite comeback people give me when I say, hey, you should be learning programming. Like, well, that's, AI, AI is going to eliminate that in a few years. I'm like, it's the stupidest nope. thing I ever heard. No one who understands programming thinks that AI is going to eliminate programming. The people saying programming is going to be eliminated is 100% for people who have never written a single line of code in their entire <laughs> lives. Exactly. It, what they don't understand is everybody is going to be a programmer. Like it's not that programming goes away; it's that you can use pro the the software. I, I, actions thumbing me down, but here's why. Like, guess what? ChatGPT does when you ask it to solve problems. It writes Python, right? So, it, being able to do that as a human is exactly just a tool in your belt, which um, makes it more important than ever to learn programming now. Because if you wait until AI is taken over then your competition has increased a thousandfold. So <laughs> yep. would you rather have a skill when your competition is 0.01% of the world? Or would you rather have a skill when your competition is 90% of the world? Like if you, if Amen. your goal has anything to do with building software or products, you probably want to be building it when not many other people can do it when you have a much bigger moat. And so now would be the time to learn programming. A hundred percent. And I couldn't agree more. Do, do you mind if I chime in real quick on on that comment about Go J Crypto? Awesome. So I think we're, we're focusing on the wrong sector, right? Programmers are always programmers, right? Critical thinkers, um, solving code, solving problems, right? That's a little bit different. But look at what the what the codes are solving. That's the problem, right? Um, putting the trained models on robots to go work at warehouses now people don't can't work on warehouses putting the those trained models as a customer service assistant now you have call centers downsizing not 90 percent of the workforce as those news articles have come out so yeah i think you know that the, there are jobs that are threatened 100 percent, mm-hmm. right? right but you know maybe not the coder themselves but what the code brings, yeah. right? especially with pre-trained models and, 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 and those, you know, whatever they're, they're, um, they're fine tuning to, to put over these layers. So yeah, that's yeah fair, point. fair point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of robotics um, augmented by LLMs. That's going to be pretty exciting to see what yeah. happens. So by the, by the way, everybody, if you could just do me a little favor, go hit the purple bubble on the bottom, right. And just say, uh, tell us where you're tuning in from. Um, and uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. So the purple button in the bottom right, say hello. And also people will probably follow you that way. So, um, so, so don't forget to do that. So Malcolm, go ahead. Yeah, no, I wanted to add to that because, yeah, people typically think, you know, that it's the most peripheral field that's going to be greatly affected by this. But really, and, you know, just probably me oversharing, I work in research, uh, medical research. And so... One of the main things that I've seen and that I've noticed is that a lot of the more esoteric statutes, you know, the laws, the uh, policies when it comes to, you know, pretty much the governing sort of uh, the ICH guidelines and whatnot that we typically go by in research, a lot of those are now being able to be seen by AI. And so 
what you really end up having is that if this thing has already bled over into an esoteric field like clinical research, you know, drug development and all of that, then I just wonder if, you know, because coders will always be able to adapt. Let's be honest, like, you know, engine, you know, software engineering or whatnot, they'll always be able to adapt and find a reason to justify their means. But in more inflexible fields, things like the medical industry, things where, you know, we, you know, even in chemistry where, you know, it's like almost all of the, you know, the set building blocks for it have already been discovered. It's not like you can necessarily like create too many new permutations. Yes, you can you can create new molecules and you can find out attachment points and you know develop it that way. But you know, in those fields, I actually feel like AI is going to have a more profound effect on jobs and what a hundred percent. And especially with statutes. And you know, again, especially when you get into regulatory science, like it gets even scarier for you know people mm -hmm. that work in this field. And so that's really where I think we need to kind of keep our eyes out. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Malcolm. And, and again, this is like a plea to everybody listening, you know, dive in and try to use the tools to build new things because you want to be ahead of the wave. Um, like Alex is saying, you have a moat right now and the fact that you're in this space right now and you're aware of this stuff. Um, and if you just take one idea and say, I want to build something around this um, that solves a need or, or, solves a problem or does something for me, it gives you a, a like, I would say a hundred X advantage right now. Whereas that advantage is going to decay to where it's just, everybody is going to have uh, an AGI in their pocket on their iPhone. Um, and, and it's too late at that point. So um, just a thought there. So action, you've had your hand up forever. What's up? Man, I, I mean, I'm glad you said that because it, it goes back to what you're saying about become a creator, not a user. And th this this correlates exactly to a T when I tell people that you got to have a business, not a hobby. A hobby is something you waste time, you know, time and resources on. A business is how you become rich. It's you know, you get you get a tax deduction uh, for that GPT if you're using it for a business instead of just wasting that money away. Amen. Like, it's just you got to <laughs> change that mindset. That's what it is. Become change a builder. You're looking at things, and I, I think the you know just to help the, the tribe out here you're using paul that's that's new testament you got to go back a little bit further so like elisha and the chariots of fire like there he, you he, go he, he, he <laughs> prayed so that you know his buddy over there like can he can we see what you know is actually going on because my servant isn't seeing what i'm seeing all of a sudden it's like oh we got mountains and hills and <laughs> horses that. chariots of fire like all sorts of stuff <laughs> exactly and that's what, you know GPT does for us right like it opens our eyes it allows us to see that there's a whole world out there that we now have access to and it's like we get a choice of just looking at it or actually going into it and i highly recommend anybody that's listening in get in there build something as silly as you might think it is go give it a shot i mean you got kids Amen. go ask your kid what are you what are you imagining today what are you thinking about and go build that like man and I, I love utilizing my kids i mean this is a little selfish but i use my kids imagination all the time to build it. stuff just for fun, just so that you I can get my own be stealing going. your kids' IP. If it's their IP, you technically own it. Steal all your kids' IP. <laughs> I mean, I, I, technically, I do it so that I can pay them, you know, a, a salary and go into a Roth IRA so they're millionaires by the there time you they're go. 18. Speaking of kids, I had something hilarious happen the other day. Um, we were driving in the car, and my uh, Devin, my kiddo, uh, who's 13, he's like, Dad, um, if you buy a car wash, then I will work there for less than minimum wage. And, and I will, I'll work there less than my brother will. <laughs> it's like, whoa, this is next level brother shit. Like trying to undercut his brother to work cheaper for dad. I was like, I don't think this is healthy y'all. So, um, you know, he's going to ask for a raise within a week. Right? <laughs> just, just saying a hundred percent. So before we go to the next hand, I want to say uh, hi to more friends out there. D three PO. Good to see you. Caesar, Mike Fritz, Frank Z, Jackie. Good to see you as well. King Arf bunch of friends in the audience thanks for stopping by okay um let's go i think pappy had uh, their hand up longest and then we'll go to the voice after that yeah i was uh, i was up and down because uh some of the points i wanted to make got, got uh, spoken about but i just wanted to circle back around to what uh i think it's melly and ryan you both had talked about um you both had talked about, I think, like the, the front end and the back end. So, for example, with any type of technology, um, for us to, to wish for something not to be developed, like AI or, or anything, um, is coming from a place of fear, right? And so it's, it's all about the individual behind the technology and their intentionality and how they direct it. Um, it's, Amen. you know, whether, whether you choose to be the person, the leader, or say, for example, the user, 
Um, we should still all be, you know, pushing for um, the development of things because, for example, that's on the that's on the front end. On the back end, the development of AI can help, uh, like uh, Melly was saying, can help reduce the amount of uh, tasks that we need to do in an everyday, um, you know, workday or, um, you know, say food, water, shelter, any of those things, data, finance, um, medical can, can reduce a lot of the uh, strenuousness of uh, completing these uh, tasks that AI can do, um, which then leads to more of a creative renaissance. So it leads to an, uh, an opportunity for culture to actually move into a space of more abstract thinking, uh, more creativity, and more ideas to come through um, because people are actually under less strain, under less tension, under less stress so that mm. they can actually move into a space of, you know, uh, creating more things and new ideas, new theories, new new stuff that we've never actually, you know, thought was possible because we're actually uh, coming from a different place, say, in our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual selves because technology has stepped in to do monotonous things at a way higher level. So I, I, I personally, you know, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of things that I don't know how to do, but there, I have a lot of good people around me, right? So AI steps in as, um, you know, a, a tool to, to do that as well too, say blockchain technology as well too. Right. Um, I, I, I love in the times where I've been able to utilize technology, um, that it has given me more free time to sit with myself and see what is my direction and what are the intentions of what I'm doing in my life. Because so much of the time we're, we're so, um, you know, focused on the destination for say, uh, instead of the actual experience of things, because we have to, we have right. to eat and we have to, <laughs> we have to eat. Uh, we have yeah. to eat and we have to pay for bills and we have to, um, yep. you know, we have pain and suffering as human beings. Right. And yeah, you want to be able to move, move to your, to your forward foot. So uh, exactly. Poppy, we're, we're running out of time. So I'm going to go to the next speaker if that's okay. But I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Like absolutely. Um, this is about allowing, empowering people to go on their front foot instead of their back. Um, so yeah, we, only have, we only have about seven minutes. So we'll uh, talk to a couple more speakers if you've been on stage uh, for a while and you feel like you've made your point, feel free to cycle off and we'll get a couple more up here before we finish. Um, let's go to the voice next. Ryan, you touched on this earlier and I wanted to kind of double down on it because I do believe it's the next level is everybody in here is encouraging people to go to chat GPT, learn how to code, do all that. And you touched on it a little bit, but eventually you get to the next level, which is wanting to run things locally on your own machine. And this is the level that I've started to get into now. And one of the things that's great about this is it gets into like crypto, where crypto is like by where it's like, oh, not your keys, not your coins. Everything is, uh, you know, permissionless and that sort of thing. Well, in AI, whenever you run things on your own machine, you kind of break free from any of the walled garden that you get that you might get from ChatGPT or MidJourney. For instance, there's some images in Midjourney that they'll be like, whoa, I don't know that we're going to show anything with, you know, cleavage or something like that. You, you'll run into some type of uh, barriers with Midjourney. Whenever you run with Stable Diffusion on your own computer, then it, it, it has, it, it's more of you are in control and not some entity is in control. So I really think that that's kind of the next level as well, is not only learning it through some of these, you know, paid services like ChatGPT, but mm. then so being able to uh, expand past that and running things locally. So anyway, to 100%. me, 102 level class. Yeah, I love it. Thanks the voice. It's, yeah, so for all of you that cycled in uh, after we talked about that, the idea is go grab an LLM, which you can download and run it locally on your machine, and you don't even have to be connected to the internet. And as the voice is saying, it, you can uh, mold the LLM to help you do what you need to do. Right, and it's just like open source code, where you download it, and you modify it to your needs, um, versus having to do what Bard tells you or ChatGPT um, tells you. So, um, let's go. Uh, welcome to the stage, D3PO. How you doing? I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you doing? Good. To, good to hear from you. What's on good your mind? To see you. Good to, so, uh, yeah, I, I was listening to Poppy, and it, and it gave me some thoughts. Uh, I was first introduced to ChatGPT, spending my time in the NFT space and on X. And uh, you know, the first question everyone asked me was. Can you be replaced by Chat BB, you know, Chat GPT or AI? And it, it, that was the first thought, and so it made me think about what do I do, and can it be replaced totally? And then listening to what Poppy said is what I've been thinking is how do you integrate it into your work? You know, for instance, when I draft a petition, almost every single time, the first five or six paragraphs of that petition 
or just filler, venue, jurisdiction, things that I don't have to give a single bit of thought to that you that chat GBT could probably if I told them I'm drafting a petition for this type of code article or something like that, I think it could put it in there. And that would take away a lot of the downtime. It would save my clients money. When I go to uh, you know charge them for what I have to draft, it would save them money there. It would save me time and peace of mind. And I think that along the way, if, if people start to think like Poppy was saying, how do you integrate it into your life without thinking, is it going to replace me? Is it going to do this? Is it going to do that? Uh, and, and use it in different ways. I do think it, like you guys were saying, now I don't know how to code, right? So I would have to be able to D3, let, let's fix that. Okay. So <laughs> after this, you got to go talk to ChatGPT and say, teach me to write a basic Python script and then, and then come back and I'll, and see, and that I'll check be, in your homework. That would be fascinating. And then the, and the <laughs> only other thing I was thinking, Ryan, which I thought was kind of wild is my first experience with ChatGPT was really watching everybody create art uh, in the space. And I enjoyed that. But what's really struck me lately since we hadn't talked in a while is the amount of phone calls I get now from ChatGPT every single day. I get a number of phone calls from ChatGPT that are mind-boggling. If you, if, unless you try to wreck it, unless you go out of your way to make it impossible to talk to you, it will lead you down the path to wherever it needs to get you to have a conversation. Isn't that amazing? That, it's amazing. That is truly amazing to me. I know. I use I use the voice feature all the time on ChatGPT+. Plus. It's just, it, yeah, it's amazing. Um, but D3, good to hear from you. All right. You too, man. We got three minutes left, um, so I'm actually going to pass it back to Wolf um, to help close out the space. But this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I got to say, Ryan, you you have to be you just went to all time on my list of moderators out here. This was a master class this past hour. Uh, I, I know we've done a few spaces together, but this was so much fun uh, for me to just be here and observe. What's up, Alex? Ryan's Ryan's amazing. He's been a, a good friend of mine. You guys for a are too while. kind. Don't don't talk about me. I appreciate y'all. But we have some amazing speakers on stage, and look at the audience, right? No, That's what no, makes we're it. gonna talk about you, Ryan. You're Ryan. Alex, Ryan. except you're nice. Ryan, Ryan. <laughs> like yeah, he's like the nice, uh, charismatic, personable version of me. I'm just kind of the, the asshole bully on stage who makes fun of people. But you make me laugh, Alex. So that's nice. But Wolf, thanks for having us, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, this was this was super super fun. Uh, let's definitely run it back shortly. Uh, I'll be in touch through the DMs. Amazing participation from the audience as well. I saw so many people commenting where they're from, their levels of AI, coding experience. I honestly think people are probably generally motivated to go and learn some skills coming out of this space. So you don't take away th things like that from every single space, in my opinion. Um, by the way, in a couple minutes, we are going to be talking about gaming. We've got some new speakers coming up. We're going to have a whole gaming space that's happening. Um, but yeah, Ryan, I'll actually turn back to you. Do you have any final comment on this topic and you know, call to action? What should people go do after this? Um, thanks. Y'all, please just go right now to even the free version of ChatGPT and say, please teach me how to write a very simple Python script. Just please do it. it and, and the nicest thing is if it sounds scary, then ask it to help you. Um, please move from a consumer to a builder and you can do it literally today. Um, and you'll be one of the most powerful people on, uh, in the world. So do that today. It's an assignment. We're going to grade it tomorrow. Um, but you all have been the best. Thanks for being here and, and everybody on stage. Thanks for being uh, funny and kind and smart and everybody in the audience. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Real pleasure. Alex, I know that you usually have to run around this time too. Did you have any other comment before I get into my gaming space here? I uh, totally back what Ryan's saying. Me and Ryan have had a couple conversations around the exact same thing. and we, we, we say it every time, which is, man, anyone can go out now and build really powerful software. And if you can go out and build really powerful software, you can build a multi-million dollar business in a weekend. Uh, I'm reading a great book right now, Million Dollar Weekend by Noah Kagan, which is all about taking a weekend and coming up with an idea and just shipping something quickly. And AI has made that whole process so much easier. Um, so if you're thinking about picking up more revenue streams, picking up new skills, building your own business, if you got that itch, AI is going to make it a lot easier. Fully agree. Uh, I, I honestly say for me, you know, one of the other biggest things that I use it for, the, the two biggest things I use it for, one is writing. And then number two is writing contracts. Good Lord, it has done so much for me in that area. Uh, so whether it's learning things, coding, whatever it is, writing contracts, so many good use cases, and people just wouldn't even believe it until they see it, how easy it is, just telling it. And also, use use a please in there, throw a please in, you know, it is trained off of people, so it does react to things that people react to. All right, uh, with that being said, we're going to roll into our gaming space. I know a lot of the panel sticking around here for it, take care, Ryan, 
Alex, if anyone else has to run, but if you are free, stick around. We'll be talking gaming here for the next hour. Dave, I am going to throw you a co-host here, and I am going to turn it over to you if you want to get us rolling into it. Uh, I feel like, to be honest, gaming is going to be one of the areas that's heavily affected by AI over the course of the coming years as people use it to build games. Uh, you have to stop the AI from playing the game and, and winning all the games. Uh, it's really taken an aimbot assist to the next level, in my opinion. So we're going to be talking about gaming, and we're going to be doing it with our friends from the World Web 3 conference who we have joining up here. Uh, I know that Jason is very partial to gaming, so I think this is kind of the perfect conversation here. And if you're someone that's interested in gaming, I know that we are going to have a lot of people in that Web3 gaming area at the conference. So quick note, and then we'll roll into it. We are drawing closer to the date. World Web3 conference is March 8th and 9th in Orlando. I will be there. I would love to meet some of y'all there. If you are at all interested right now, drop me a DM. Just send me the word conference. I'll get you all the info as well as a very generous discount code that you can use. I'm going to offer this for the next three minutes. So if you're interested, go ahead and drop me a DM. Uh, you won't regret it. With that being said, Dave, let's talk some gaming. Let me turn the mic over to you. Oh, he's breaking up. I do see, by the way, I see Samurai Games in the audience. I just went ahead. Samurai Saga sent you an invite. I hear Dave just like struggling there. Is it just me? No, okay, good. Wasn't just me. All right, with that being said then, let's hop into it. So action, <laughs> I'm coming over to you to get us rolling here a little bit. What's your take right now on maybe kind of the intersection of like how all these things we've been talking about, AI and movement into the future affects gaming, uh, as well as kind of how it all connects in the Web3 sphere? Yeah, I, honestly, it's going to change the game completely, um, pun intended there. And it's really, to me, the first area that it's going to really make a difference is uh, going to be in the development as far as Web3 is concerned. I think it's going to speed up the process of developing games where you're going to see overnight somebody creating a game that would have taken weeks upon weeks, more of the basic ones. And then you expand it there where you go games that usually take years are now going to take months to create just because of the assistance of AI. But here's the fun thing because not everybody here is a builder. Most of us are, are gamers. So when you think of a game, what makes a game fun? It's interaction. It's having people there, especially when you're talking about massive multiplayer games. It's the fact that you have other people that you connect with. Well, we're getting to the point where those connections are going to change. You're, you're, you're not going to know if you're going to be talking to an AI or a real person on the other side of your screen. So they're, right now, the barrier to entry for a lot of games like to actually get uh, you know, a foothold of any space is having people use it. And like it's, 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 a, it's a snowball effect where the more people that come in, the more people they get. And the early people, they get in there and like, well, this place is dead. And they might not come back. Well, now, the doesn't matter if you launched a game yesterday. You could have 100,000 um, you know, people playing the game right away. They just might be bots and people won't even know it. And it'll be bots very different than what we're you know, used to as far as bots go on games. It's not going to be the, the, the dumb bot running into the wall or the ex expert bot that can shoot you and kill you right away. No, it's going to be bots that are going to be able to interact with you as if they were other players. That will be able to reply to your conversations. They'll be able to actually hold a conversation with you in-game. And soon enough, you're going to think that you have a friend playing with you, only to later find out that was no friend at all. Real quick, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, my yep. gosh. My gosh. What a nightmare. What's up, everybody? Sorry, great take action. I don't mean to kind of just interrupt. I just wanted to give a quick heads up. I want to make sure that uh taco i hope i, I want to make sure you guys see my invite samurai saga marco i threw you guys all some mics i would love for you guys to kind of come up and chat gaming you guys are the experts up here um just wanted to make sure that you saw it so all you got to do is just hit the request button and we're good to go jason what's up twc24 you guys we had the most killer campaign the other day it was such a dope thing to see what we had online and i'm compiling everything by the way jason so you know for you to be able to see exactly how many of these retweets and everybody people were seeing this shit on facebook man so it went over amazingly so uh, like really re like job well done to everybody that obviously helped and contributed um so i just want to say i appreciate it but yeah let's get back into the gaming narrative my fault didn't mean to pump the brakes too hard lucas go for it brother well, no, that was really distracting. I actually forgot what I was going to say. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we've had, uh, <laughs> to, to uh, Action's point, it's, uh, there's no doubt you're going to be playing with like, 
you're going to be playing with AI, no doubt about it. And you're going to think they're there. But I mean, we've had this kind of AI for more than a decade that actually responds to you and re replies to you. So this is not like new for us. It's just new for us as a consumer to actually take advantage of and, and leverage, right? So you guys are now getting access to some tools that are so user-friendly and so powerful that you can actually build things. And the problem, the only problem I see is that you can't really build an end-to-end -end software solution with this, but if you're a developer, you can have help doing it, right? So this is like a team of junior developers working for you. Um, you could go out and come up with an idea and get the idea 80 to 85% flushed out and then find a developer to top it off with, right? Or you can be the developer, I guess, and learn what tools you need to fix. Now with gaming, it's a little bit tougher just because it's very subjective, but it also everything in this world runs off of analytics, right? So if, if you feed an LLM a bunch of games of like, hey, this game was very successful, here's why, look at the numbers, look at the stats, look at the interactions of the data that you provide it, it could take five or 10 games, mix them up probably, and build you a game, a simple game, of course, nothing crazy advanced because you also... When you're building a game, you need good developers, you need good ideas, and from the good development comes good ideas. And yeah, AI can help you build those, but it can't actually build the entire game for you because that stuff is very subjective for humans. But using analytics, it can get you there 80, 85% of the way there. And a good game is one that people play, period, right? If people play it and they play it consistently, that's a good game, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if I think it's a good game or you think it's a good game. It's The data doesn't lie. It tells you... Are people playing it? If they are, awesome. That means we have something that we could actually leverage for, for more advancement. So again, AI can like, you could actually use AI to build stuff for you, but you're not gonna be able to use AI to build the entire game for you unless it's like crazy simple, unless you're gonna say, hey, you know what? Replicate Tetris for me. That, it could copy the game, but it's not gonna make it a unique game for you. It, it's gonna Lucas. make an 80% chance of it, yeah. I really like when my junior developers um, come up with ideas for me. How, what do you think about that? Yeah, again, you know, AI does get you, um, it's perfect for, it's great for like everything, right? But to an extent, it's great for writing and ideation, but it's not going to finish off your, it's not going to finish off your thread. It's not going to finish off your article. It's not going to finish off your post. It's not going to know how to do that. You'll have to, as a human, go in and touch it up. So it's going to get you to 80 to 90%. And you're going to have to go there and change it around and make it sound like intelligently written by you and rather than AI. Like, good example, I'm on LinkedIn a lot, right? And I, I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. And I can tell when people are responding with this built-in AI tool that's on LinkedIn that we all have. And it's like, you could just see, it's just so, it uses like, um, apo like apostrophes and like in crazy places, right? And exclamation points. It, you, it way overuses exclamation points. So as soon as you see exclamation points in people's like responses, you know it's generated by AI. I've noticed that at least. I'm really good with pattern recognition. I think I'm on the spectrum a little bit. But anyway, so like that kind of stuff, um, like it's just obvious when that stuff happens. And that's why you'll always get a game or a written article or code. Like you'll never be able to build an entire, 100% an entire business around this thing. And it's not there yet. I'm not saying you can't forever. But you'll get it to 80 to 85%, maybe 90% of the way there. And then as a developer or whatever, you're going to be like a writer, whatever you are, you can get it to the, the, the extra gap, but it saves you so much time, right? At the end of the day, it's like, hey, it, got, it wrote me a book. Now I have to go in and edit the book. Editing the book will take you a week. Writing the book will take you six months to a year, right? So if it could get you there and you can edit the book in like a week or two, like that's a win. So just an example, by the way, I know I can't really write a book perfectly yet. Appreciate it, Lucas. Let's go, uh, Melly, then go Samurai Saga. Yeah, I mean, I agree with most of what you were saying, but um, with book editing, it's actually the most excruciating part. And um, basically, us authors, we kind of have a lot of jokes that we make, but to me, it's kind of like having a nervous breakdown that you know you're going to have and then you just have to recover after because editing <laughs> is so hard. So I don't know how hard it would be to edit an AI book. I mean, we'll see how, how that goes. Um, but um, just on the topic of um, 
uh, what action, and actually, Lucas, you were mentioning this as well, with um, gaming, how long it takes to create these games. There's actually, they've got a, an X account, um, a game, a simulation game called Paralives that basically everyone's given up on it ever becoming a thing, but they make a lot of money from Patreon. <laughs> so I'm not even sure if it's just a scam at this point, but um, it, I do kind of wonder if, like if they chose to incorporate AI, if they could get this stupid game finished by now because it's been like since 2019 and they're like, oh, you know, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I'm like, I don't know if it's coming. But um, like, you know, if anyone wants to make a lot of money off of making a game, there's a huge gap in the market for a new simulation game like The Sims. Um, the new Sims versions are just not great. Um, and yeah, I don't know about Paralives ever coming out. So yeah, any developers here? Um, I'd love to see what you come up with with AI and simulation. So <laughs> appreciate it, it, Melly. Thank you, Melly. Um, so uh, Samurai Saga, go for it. And then I want to chat about kind of like what we uh, kind of maybe take it back a little bit to Tuesday and what we were talking about in that space of just like like gaming and it's like Web three gaming and how it just needs to be fun. <laughs> go for it, Samurai. Hey, what's up, everybody? This, uh, this is actually Edoc. I just wanted to jump on real quick to let you know, because um, Keon, he's in he's in the courthouse right now, so he's super, super busy. And I am currently busy as F, you know, at work. So I, I can't jump on and talk right now. I just wanted to show support with the account, get in here and be a listener. Um, if I hear something and I, and I got a minute, then I'll, I'll jump on and try to talk. But I'm super, super busy. I need to get back to work. Is Samurai Saga going to be at the conference? I'm really excited if you say yes. Please say yes. Say yes. Just say say yes. that again. Is Samurai Saga going to be represented at the conference? Uh, um, I'll say let yes. Gian let you know that. <laughs> cool. Okay. Jason, I'll let you heard Gian that they're coming. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be there hey, at least in uh, uh, heart. Okay. Samurai Saga. What, uh, what channel are you doing? I forgot. What's happening right now? I can't hear. I can't. All right. I, I couldn't make that, that out either. Sorry, Sorry Dave. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. But we have Colin. Uh, Poppy, I see your hand. I just want to say hi to Colin. Colin from Thorfight. What's good, brother? What's up? What's up? What's up, everyone? Ha happy to be here. Happy to be here. I'm a little bit late into this conversation, so my apologies, everyone. I'm trying to catch up to context so I can provide some uh, decent uh, commentary. You got it. Let's go, Poppy, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, I guess uh, this is a space about gaming, so I wanted to circle around uh, like what you were saying there, bringing it back, um, not just about AI and gaming, but uh, what makes it a, a good game and what uh, the gaming evolution needs to look like in Web3. And um, I think you had quickly made the point, but uh, you know, games uh, need to be fun. Games need to be fun. They need to be enjoyable, 100%. Um, it, 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 it doesn't matter about too much other things from the beginning if you can make a good game that's really enjoyable then you can impl uh, implement like marketing you can implement uh you know some of the other tokenomic aspects some of those other things that can be sorted out i know that there's still a lot that needs to be figured out in regards to tokenomics properly in games where it's not just speculatory and um you know illusionary but actually has utility but uh, I think the two major factors to Web3 gaming right now that need to be sorted is enjoyable games, whether they are hyper-casual or casual games, they still have to be fun, and uh, user retention and user acquisition. So most Web3 games are not uh, doing super well with user acquisition. Uh, if you actually have, uh, for example, a good game, uh, you should you know, be able to, uh, you know, implement, like I said, marketing. Uh, so people actually know about the game, because even if it's a good product, if people don't know about it, then it won't be used. Um, much of the time, you know, there's a bunch of shit products and they can have really good marketing and people will make a million dollars or more, um, even if it's a shit product. So, um, a lot of the games that I'm starting to look at, you know, I'm trying to look at fundamental numbers of how many users they have, if they have an existing game already or not and who's going to solve that who's going to actually get uh, the users in 
And uh, one of the things that was coming forward that I want to share really quickly that I thought was really good, uh, we had, I think it was last week, uh, Tacky Games was on, and uh, they, I've been talking to them a little bit, and one thing that they're doing, um, which is really cool, is they're making games that are very uh, user-friendly for Web 2, and they're not trying to force people to come from Web 2 into Web 3 which um, is not going to happen, I, I don't think. I think it's going to be like uh, the effect of technology is going to be people are using blockchain, people are using AI, but they actually uh, don't know for the most part, right? It's just making the experience more accessible, more affordable, uh, more enjoyable. So uh, in, in reference to that, you know, seeing about using, taking, uh, making user acquisition in the already existing Web2 space where there's a massive amount of gamers and then implementing behind the scenes different types of uh, tokenomics or, you know, NFTs or, um, you know, different aspects of, of Web3 where the users that are invested in Web3 can benefit uh, from Web2 actually, you know, implementing uh, user acquisition. So I wanted to talk about those two things and just bring them up as the two most important things. Things. I think there's still a lot to figure out about tokenomics and how that works properly with games and Web3. But I think what is most important is having an enjoyable game and user acquisition right now. Super good, super interesting take because I was actually, Poppy, I was on the timeline and I saw Forte had posted something where he had posed the question of if you're uh, more, if you and your team are more focused, if you're, you've already rolled out a white paper and tokenomics, but you don't really have a game, then you're not really a, a gaming play like you're a DeFi project essentially which was really interesting and it got a lot like a lot of people like it the, the point really was made like it, that 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 actually hits with me so um yeah great takes bro just to, I'll, just to, yeah. just to, uh like re rephrase that really quickly uh back in <clears throat> sorry in six months to a year from now maybe if you don't have a game and we're in a bull market and there's a ton of liquidity coming in and people don't give a shit they're investing in everything that might be a way to raise money and then create a game but in the past uh two years and even still now you have to actually have a product that you know vcs are going to want to dig their teeth into uh because you have to actually have something no one's just throwing money around like crazy so i just wanted to make that comment but it's it, it depends on wh where you're at in the market but typically if, if you have a, a product to show to people that have money, then uh, you're going to have more of a more opportunity to uh, to raise more money and get more support. Yep, Colin, and then we'll go K and G. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add on to Lucas's point here about user acquisition. Um, I'm seeing trends here in games that we're onboarding onto our subnet that a lot of these games are actually setting up the top level of their funnels through traditional uh, game publishers and you know different uh, gaming platforms to get their games out there. Um, you know, on the Epic Game Store, some of them were even trying to sneak them into Steam by completely hiding and obfuscating the Web3 elements within the game. Um, to me, I think, you know, Lucas is nail on the head here. That's how we recruit. And that's how we start to acquire Web2 users. Um, good games, absolutely. But good games that are being marketed towards these Web2 users, you know, using traditional logins to log into these gaming experiences without any kind of promise of on-chain activity, user-owned assets, any kind of tokenization or financialization. That's the way that we onboard these users. And it, it turns into something where once these users are into these games, or participating heavily, and they start hearing, uh, you know, Web3 users within those games going, oh, well, now my skin is worth X amount um, or, or, you know, my asset is worth X amount. That's the way that we start to, you know, push them through the funnel going, venturing into an eventuality of, you know, total Web3 domination. Total Web3 domination. So we're going to go K and G. Then I want to, I want to, I want to tap I, in you with mind if I, I respond? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, uh, yeah, man, I think, I think you're right. I think also that uh, we hide the, as people say in the space, I can't remember who said it first, but like hide the wires or hide the piping. Like that's how you're going to get the web two. And I hate saying web two and web three. I guess this is a good way of de delineating here in this case, but I think it's just people who like games, who like to play good games, will play a good game, regardless if it's, uh, uh, you know, as long as they don't know anything about NFTs, the term NFT or web three, it's like a, that instantly turns everybody off right now. And I'm sure you, if, if you guys are in games, you know, the influencers that are in this game, <laughs> that are in the games, that play games a lot. If they hear the word NFT, they instantly cut you down and never literally talk to you again, label you as a scam to millions of followers instantly. So if you're a Web3 game, stop calling yourself a Web3 game. Do it behind closed doors. 
do it to the purest, but have two campaigns always. Your two messages will always be, we have a great game. And then if you need to talk to a purist, oh, it's on blockchain. You know, like that's it, right? That's just don't put that as a marketing feature because you're talking to like 500 people with web three terminology. And if you're talking about games and just good games, you're talking to millions of people. Bring up web three and NFTs, you're talking to like 500 people again. So, I mean, look, look, you know, the vast majority of these web three games already have the attention of the web three community. We're a bunch of crypto nerds. We're actively out there looking for new experiences and new projects. When we're talking about marketing towards web two users, you're damn right. We need to avoid the buzzwords that have painted us in a negative light from the last cycle. Um, one thing I do want to notice, and I do want to make this, you know, point out maybe as an elitist web three user here. Uh, but even though we have really negative connotations towards, you know, NFT technology or on chain transactions or player owned assets, um, the the core value of what NFTs introduce into the gaming world are still intrinsically valuable towards Web2 gamers, irregardless of the terminology that they put behind it. Look at the secondary markets for all of these different free-to-play games that have you know multi-billion dollar secondary markets, CSGO skins, the skins for all the different Roblox, Roblox and Fortnite and all of that. You know, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, I think it's about easing them into uh, Web3 and potentially not even using the same buzzwords that have painted them in a negative light because the value of what our technology uh you know present presents is intrinsically valuable towards these web 2 users they just have a negative connotation and it's, and it's our job to uh really start to fix that and it's that starts with exactly what lucas said good games and high quality game uh you know addicting gameplay loops first let's go uh, jason i'm gonna come to you after this i want to hear from mr I, I used to teach game dev uh right after kng so uh, i want to hear from you but kng thanks for the patience man uh, it's all good. Thank you for having me. So um, <clears throat> I'll just get into like how my team does things, and I think you guys like hit all the nails on the head. Um, so basically, when you log into our DEX, it's a ZK wallet, meaning that you do not even have a seed phrase, let alone the user doesn't even know what their own address is. They literally are signing in with a Google ID, Apple ID, or Microsoft Microsoft account. And I can tell you the only reason why we have good... Um, Good, uh, good traffic on our test net. It's just because of how simple the onboarding procedure is. We do not even in our uh, in our dev meetings. We don't even refer to things as like what two, what three. We just say, oh, these are power users versus regular traditional users. You know, like how in depth do they want to get with the experience? And it's funny, like we're we're in the middle of talking about doing custom skins. And even though the technology is technically like an NFT, we don't even mention that in our branding, let alone site. We say like, here, click here, sign in with your email to claim your free skin. So I think it's like, it's a whole, like we have become like, the space has become like, I hate to say we're a bunch of nerds and a bunch of engineers, and we have built it for a bunch of nerds and a bunch of engineers, but we need to like, change our focus and say okay how do we attract masses and we have great tech it's just that how do we portray it as user-friendly not so complicated something that a user can pick up for the first time and know what to do because like i remember my first time looking at all these technologies i had to go and <clears throat> look up a bunch of like youtube videos read documentation white papers we need to stop that we have to like put a big focus on UI design and user implementation, you know? So that's my experience. You always remember your first time, right, King? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I want to go really quick. Just let's go, Mona, because I have a feeling like there's something per like and I have a feeling I know what she's going to say, and then we'll go. What, Jason, I'm going to come to you. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you, Well, for having me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's such a great topic and it's 2024 and, you know, it's time to really put on the table what you got. And I'm going to, uh, just give a little story. Once upon a time, three years ago, four guys came together. Uh, one was a former JP Morgan employee looking for a new job. Uh, the second guy was a convenience store working at a local, uh, I think it was a 7-Eleven, and he was in love with making gun animations. And the two other guys, they had absolutely no game making experience. These guys, these four guys had $10,000 
a whole lot of ambition, and all they wanted to do was make a fun game. They didn't care to make money. They just wanted to play something fun and have, have put something fun in, in people's hands. Three years later, and a whole lot of obstacles, Pal World was born uh, not too long ago, and this game has sold... Um, over se- well, first of all, over 7 million people played the game just in the first week. 2 million were playing it at some point concurrently. And it landed itself the number two spot on Steam's most players list. And here we are, it's 2024, and people in Web3 Gaming are still asking, how do we disrupt? How do we achieve mainstream adoption? And the paradigm shift has always happened in one way and one way only choose an already existing game genre that already is here and make the best version of it and then use the web3 model um whether it's the nft feature whether it's the tokenomics feature just use one of the features or all the features as your new business model and and but what's important here and the lesson to be learned here is that when you build a captivating ip then people will virally share it you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And the, this is how the paradigm shift has happened every single time. So I just wanted to remind everyone of this story that just blew everyone away in 2024. Uh, and that was Pal World. Yeah, we actually had Rudo that was talking about in our Tuesday space saying he spent all his time <laughs> in Pal World this week. Jason, what do you think? Oh my goodness. I don't even know where to take all this. You guys are hitting so many different things between the AI, the assets, the, the writing, the programming. Um, really quick for the new people that don't know me, um, I'm the co-founder for the World Web 3 Conference here in Orlando, Florida. And I spent 13 years of my career as a technology educator and I taught 3D modeling and animation and uh, game development. So this is right up my alley. Um, and, and one thing I keep ever hearing everyone talk about like making a fun game, right? And the one thing and the one word that I think we really need to remember here is immersion, right? So immersion is kind of defined into like 12 different categories, if you will. One of them, like, it's like why gamers play games, right? Like we can incorporate all that Web3 models, you know, token economics, you know, leasing, set NFTs, play to earn, uh, free to play and earn, whatever. But at the core of every good game, is the reason why we're actually playing the game. And really quick, I'll give you an example. Last weekend, I was bored out of my skull. I wanted to play a game. I asked my wife what she's playing with her friends. She's been telling me about this game called Lethal Company. I jump in the game. Uh, it's a game where you just hunt, hunt for items, monsters chase you, you run back to base, you dump it, and you earn money. And that's basically the premise of the game. I had so much fun because I was scared out of my mind, and I don't really do well in fear games. But it was an escapism for me. So that was the reason why I wanted to play. So that's one of those primary appeals. Like, are we creating games that create escapism, emotional connections? Uh, or how are we increasing enjoyment and satisfaction? These things have to be questioned first before we talk about, um, you know, how are we going to earn the most money from our players? You know, because that if that's your mindset going into making a game, you're going to fail. Because there's games developed by the for the gamers, and then you have the games that are developed just for profit making. Uh, and we we don't want that. We want games that are going to have immersion and that sense of presence. Um, you know, as if you get better at the game, there's greater sk challenges or skills involved. There's social connections. That's what I look for in games. I love MMOs because I like making friends, uh, talking to people, have uh, meeting people from around the world. That's really really important to me. Um, even just playing this co-op game that I was playing with four other people. You know, I when 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 I realized it was just going to be me and my wife playing, I was like, "Oh, is anybody else joining us?" That was my first question, and sure enough, we had other players come. So that that creates that you know enhanced sense of connection with other players. That's that's another way that we can you know push forward good game narratives, right? And some game, some people just play games for narrative. Uh, you know, that's all. That's another thing. Having rich backstory, you know, becoming deeply engaged with uh, the story, and not just as an observer, but as an active participant. Like, you feel like you're involved in the story. Uh, you know, maybe it's just an explore, exploration game. So that you, you can take these different genres and models, you can mix them up and match them. That's, this is why I like Grand Theft Auto so much, because there's a sense of kind of all of this mixed in to this one game, even though it could be extremely inappropriate for younger audiences. But you get my point, I hope. Um, you know, so 
we just want sensory engagement first and we want it, it doesn't have to be about advanced graphics uh or you know like this, this outstanding a plus rated game we we want to see a fun game first and this kind of goes into everything everybody was encompassing before we start talking about all of these you know ways to make money um so that was kind of like what i was thinking you know I, as everybody was talking because like uh, i think it was lucas that mentioned this or maybe it was poppy but um you know like those old terms that that kept popping up in the last cycle the p to e play to earn free play to earn nft you know nft assets and game assets and we can create those web2 games we can incorporate this stuff and the people that want to take advantage of token economics or DeFi integrations they will right um so yeah i i think that we just again we have to focus on the player first before we actually start um, trying to develop, um, you know, a game for profit. And, and I think if you have that mindset, you can be successful. And if you want to actually learn how to start creating games, and this goes into what you guys were talking about last time with the, in, in the last meeting with Python, you know, you, you can use all these AI tools. I think Lucas mentioned it. You can create a game 80, 90% of the way by, uh, you know, creating 2D and 3D assets um, using AI systems. You can have it do the writing for your characters in your backstory. You can now program using AI. You know, you can create these if, then, and or statements and object-oriented language using these AI scripts and not really have to do much of the work that, you know, I used to teach my students. They still need the foundation. They still need to know how to draw a 3D asset, but now they can have AIs doing it for them. They still need to understand if, then, object-oriented rate uh, language, but now they can have AI do it for them. We're, reach, we're, we're in a revolutionary stage in game development, um, especially with uh, these automated procedural you know, generation tools, these AI driven world machine creators. I mean, that is huge. You know how long it takes to create a 3d asset and, and put a, a you know, a texture on it and, 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 and out, you know, put it out. Um, it, it's, 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 in, it's exhausting. It takes teams and teams of people. It takes so much time. Now you have these, these tools, you got um, the AI tools built into unity and unreal you got NVIDIA's GanGan system. Um, these, they're all procedural generation tools. You can create entire cities in minutes. Uh, so anyway, I could I could go on and on, but um, I really, you guys got me, I felt like that frog meme that's like vibrating. I'm like, I got so much to say. <laughs> I love it. He's like, I got so much to say. Real quick, Poppy, I just wanted to go to, Gab, what's good? Yeah, I was just curious before we go to some of the other hands, Jason, how are you guys tying, because you're obviously so involved in this gaming world, how are you tying in gaming with the conference? Yeah, so right now, what? Not, okay, uh, there's two things I want to say. We do have two very prominent speakers in the AI, uh, in the gaming space. We've got uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Hiddlebrandt from Smoke.io. He's going to be doing a whole blockchain gaming or NFTs kind of uh, thing in the Web3 gaming space. And then we also have um, Scott Herman, uh, and he's the VP of strategic partnerships over at Wagme Games. And he's going to be doing a whole thing on Web3 Gaming as well. But here's what we, and I had this conversation with uh, a gentleman called Andrew Wall, Metamona. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar. You guys are going to be doing a, uh, a talk on stage about Web3 marketing. Um, and we, my vision for the, the World Web3 Conference is to ultimately turn it into the World Web3 Gaming Conference. And because of my history in gaming, and also, just so you all non understand and, and know, I have actually been a very prominent player in the gaming space since I was very young. I started playing like Doom, Duke Nukem 3D when I was eight years old. Um, sorry, my cat is visiting me. Um, and by the time I was 15 years old, I was literally running the best Medal of Honor Allied Assault crew. In I, Nobody could defeat us. We were completely undefeated. We used to match make on forums before you know matchmaking was a thing. Um, I, I ran with zero degrees in rainbow six, three, we were number one ranked on basically all the ladders. Um, I've gone into matches where I've wiped out entire, uh, you know, entire teams, not even letting my teammates get kills and call of duty Four. I was ranked, uh, number one in North America for three months running back in 2008. I have a, a hell of a legacy in gaming. I should have, I should have started YouTubing is what I should have done. I had people telling me that but um this is my passion it's always been my passion it's very near and dear to me and that's why we want to turn this conference and pivot into more of a focused conference on the web3 
gaming environment. And um, maybe we can set our sights on GDC as our main competitor. You know, we can we could do it opposite sides of the calendar and see what we can do. Poppy. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Thank you, Jason. I think the 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 um, the switch from and the focus into a theme. Oh, sorry. A, a theme in uh, specific in Web three and gaming, I think, is really really important. Uh, in many ways, I mean, the, obviously the the gaming industry in Web two is is absolutely huge. And you know, stick around back to my initial points. Um, you know what Thorfy was talking about and uh, reiterating as well too. Um, yeah, Jason had mentioned the immersion aspect to gaming, <clears throat> and we're talking about gaming being enjoyable and then that leading to user acquisition and retention so we got to look at the human experience and see like what actually captivates people so we're talking about uh you know in the last bull run like play to earn i, I worked for eight months on a solana development um uh back just at the end of the last bull run into the first part of the bear market and it was a game on solana called bloomverse and so that we, we, I keyed this, uh, instead of us calling it a play to earn, um, game, it was play to enjoy. And so the, the factor of enjoying the game is super important, but why do we actually enjoy games? It's, it's actually because they have an emotional effect on us. They, they, they they have some type of uh, effect that's more than just where are we going to get to? Oh, I want to earn this thing, which is a dopamine effect. So the dopamine loop is super, super important. Oh, I, you know, I play and I earn this thing and now I feel better, right? But the actual enjoyment aspect of the game itself and the emotional connection, whether that's through storyline, whether that's actually through, um, like Jason was talking about, like, you know, uh, uh, an endorphin rush from a fear-based game or whatever, we have to actually create games that are actually having an emotional effect on people where uh, they're tapping into certain centers within them that are creating an attachment to coming back and playing the game more and consistently wanting to play the game and creating narratives around it and getting other people involved. So I think that's one thing is looking at the effect of what, how it ha what, what it has on people and actually having developers that care about their customer base, not just care about profit, which can be challenging because so many people think that that's what success is, is making profit. But if you're, you know, bettering people's lives and, you know, making them a little bit less stressful and, you know, creating a product that you enjoy that you can ship out to others that they're going to enjoy as well too and then of course you can make money from it then that's great but i just wanted to circle back around to that because i think that a lot of the time we, we we lose the actual the essence of you know the moment and actually appreciating something and are so focused on the destination that uh we end up creating shit and garbage and it doesn't actually help people right um so yeah i just wanted to touch on that point again and i think it's you know important to start to look at the aspects of whether it is whatever the products we're developing, whether it's gaming or whatever, uh, how is it going to affect a person and create an emotional connection with them and better them in some way or another? Because then I think those are going to be the ones that are longstanding. I think of like Halo or Diablo or you know, think of The Sims or you know, uh, um, what was it? Um, uh, what was the some of the N sixty four games that were in, in the very beginning, like 007 and and those. They actually had a, a strong emotional effect on people and we still play them today and we still remember them today as legacy games, right? So if we can look at actually recreating, um, you know, not recreating, but looking at those legacy games and seeing what type of emotional effect they created. And then in the background, like I said in the beginning, implementing tokenomics and other aspects that are going to better the game. One more point, Amazon, everybody uses it. No one knows about how they do their shipping and receiving, what type of technology they have, a data storage, any of those things. No one gives a shit about that. Some people do, but the majority of people that use the product don't care about it at all, right? They just use the product because it's super user-friendly. The UI, um, it's very well known. It's super affordable and you get your shit quick, right? So if blockchain technology and AI can actually be implemented into gaming without people knowing about it, then that's great as well too because people don't generally care care they just want things they want to they want to create stuff they want to consume things they want to enjoy things right and i think a lot of that in web3 will actually be sorted out when we look at um the effect of how um you know web3 in many ways and, and blockchain technology started with the stick to fight the financial crisis to to fight uh, traditional finance and had this like really strong rooted morality in it 
Um, and I think that that's important, but if people want to make money and people want to move forward and get as much of the technology out to people as possible, some of those storylines that we're holding so tightly onto that no one else cares about, um, we have to be able to f keep those in our hearts and, and, and then just allow for the technology to be out there and maybe not be so front facing and allow for it to be more utilized so people can use it and it can further things. But uh, so it's, it's kind of like our own psychology looking at ourselves like, oh, um, you know, decentralization, you know, has to be at the forefront or people need to know what's going on. No, they, they really don't. We can still benefit from the technology being used because we're creating it. But uh, people generally don't need to know w w what's going on to, to use it or adopt it.